so yeah, I'm Justin Cormack. I work in the, um, the Cambridge team in Cambridge, UK um, of Docker, which is um, may, largely consists of the people who came as part of Unikernel Systems and some more people who we've hired since, and roving people like Jerome, who come and occupy our office every now and again when he's, uh, when he's passing by on his lightning tours. Um, and so, um, um, before I started Docker, I actually co-wrote a book on Docker, which has recently come out in Chinese. So I've actually written a book I can't read, which is quite cool. Um, um, so uh, take a look at that if you want. Yeah, so um, as Jerome said, um, Docker for Mac was this kind of um, project that we did when we started it at Docker just to kind of get familiar with, uh, work with everyone and um, build, a, build a cool project that was something completely different from what we'd actually been working on just to um, kind of, um, well, just to kind of see what we could, what we could do at Docker and um, get, to, get to work with everyone else and um, integrate into the, into the team and also um, really build something really kind of lovely. And it was the first beta that Docker had done. Um, and uh, so we got this rather nice um, beta site that you may have signed up on. Who here is using Docker for Mac or Windows? All right, so about, about half of you at least, maybe more. Um, and this was kind of the way, that we, what we wanted to do. Um, Number one thing is just install Docker. It's just there, the little whale's there to remind you Docker's running, um, and that's all you have to do, and you can just use Docker all day long. I've never actually used the quit Docker button, I don't think. Um, um, make it work just like on Linux. I mean, when I first used Docker, I used it on Linux, and it was all very straightforward, and you got kind of used to it like that. And then you used it on the Mac, and it wasn't really quite the same. You had to set environment variables and understand things about Docker machine, and it was just seemed a bit fiddly. Whereas Linux, it was just kind of just worked. Um, file notifications, yeah, Solomon mentioned those in, uh, in, the, in the keynote today. It was one, um, and, and Anne used them in his demo. So one of the things that a lot of people complained about not, not working because um, their dev environments like to, you, you know, you type something in and it, you want to automatically refresh your code and, and so on, which um, was impossible to do with the old Docker toolbox. VirtualBox, no one ever came to us and said they really loved VirtualBox. <laughs> Um, it was just, you know, one of those things that you put up with, but it didn't really um, work. And then as, also, as Solomon said, get out of the way. Just, you know, it's not intrusive. You don't have to use, you know, there's the interface where you don't have to use it. The word, it just, just the little whale. Um, and make, make, it, make it simple. Make the powerful stuff simple. Um, so... We started out doing this, um, and um, we uh, were using it in, uh, internally for quite a long time before the beta. Um, in fact, I've never installed Docker tool, Toolbox on this computer. It's always just run Docker for Mac. I've used the um, our developer stream, which usually, I think twice I've had to uninstall it because we broke, we pushed a build out that was too broken to actually use, but that's twice in six months or so. So um, uh, we've all sat there and used it every day. Um, as soon as we announced it, we got 30,000 signups straight away. Um, it, we were at the top of Hacker News and everyone was trying to get, get a copy of it. And, um, uh, and then we've had another um, Another 40,000 people since that, that first lot of sign-ups. Um, and people have told us they really, really like it. Um, it's basically people, when people have had problems, they've 
been hassling us on Twitter and on the forums and by email because they use it every day and really need it to work. Um, and we have, you know, we, it's, it's a beta and we've broken a few things, but we've, uh, as, uh, we've had to fix them as quickly as possible because people are, people are really complaining. So let's take a look at how it's actually, um, how it's actually built. Um, if you um, look at the Docker, the processes with Docker in the name on, on the Mac, um, Windows is kind of similar, but um, this is kind of all, all, the, all the pieces of it that I'm going to go through. Um, it's truncated the command lines because they're a bit long, but you can, you can understand a bit from that. So there's, um, there's Hyperkit, um, the hypervisor, there's a back-end process, there's a database process, there's a Linux, some Linux processes, there's one process that runs as root, which is the root helper, which um, um, does a few things that can't be done as a normal user, but everything else we'll talk about as a normal user. Um, and um, well, I'll talk through all those things now. Let's start with Hyperkit. Um, so Hyperkit is um, a separate open source project, Docker open source project, that we launched um, a few weeks ago at OSCON. It's um, only used on Docker for Mac. Docker for Windows uses um, Hyper-V, which is, comes built into Windows 10. Um, so a few years ago, Apple um, released a thing called Hypervisor Framework as part of OS X. Um, and basically, it's a, it's a little set of interfaces that let you create a little uh, a process that is a hypervisor and can run another operating system just inside a single process. Um, it's very lightweight. It's really quite cool. It's incredibly badly documented. Um, and no one used it for a while um, until the Xhive project started, um, which was a kind of half port, half rewrite of the FreeBSD Beehive project. Um, and Xive was really cool because it could actually run Linux um, and FreeBSD um, on your Mac. It was kind of a bit command line-y and difficult, kind of difficult to use. And, but um, but it, it, it worked really well. And so um, the, pretty much the first thing we did on day one of um, building Docker for Mac was we took Xhive and we plumbed it in and booted up Linux on the Mac. And um, that, was, that was really the kind of first day of, um, the first day of Docker for Mac was just running Xhive and, and, and turning it into something. And then, started, then we started adding stuff to it, fixing bugs and so on. And that's the bit that we spun out as Hyperkit. Um, we added things like the sparse block device. Um, OSX, the, the file system on OX, uh, OSX doesn't actually have um, any support for um, sparse files. Um, though Apple actually finally announced at WWDC that their new file system will. But in the meantime, um, we use the QCAL format that um, QMU uses for, and KVM uses um, in order that we don't have to, um, the disk that, that stores all your Docker images doesn't have to be a whole 64 gig or 128 gig or so of space if you're not using that space on the Mac. Um, and you can configure the XI the, the kind of parameters, the amount of memory, and CPU. The defaults are kind of sensible, um, but you might want to increase the memory if you're running a lot of containers. Um, I can't remember what I usually um, have. Oh, this is oh, two gig. That's a bit, um, um, so that's really um, that's really hyperkit. So it's it's kind of it's very it's still very close to upstream Xive, but with uh, with those extra features. Um, um, the next, the next component is DataKit. So DataKit, DataKit is a really interesting project. Again, it's a new open source project at Docker. 
it's um, as of a few weeks ago. Um, for Docker for Windows and Mac, we actually don't use very many of its features at all. It's a really, really exciting project. It's basically um, a Git store for data structures and for progr distributed programs to use um, data structures which you can treat like normal Git objects. You can merge them, you can fork them and rebase them and, um, and so on. We just use it as a way of storing configuration um, and yes, the configuration for Docker Mac is actually stored in a, um, in a Git tree. So um, you can um, take a look if you look in, um, the, in that library containers com.docker data database. There is a, um, a .git file. This is actually a Git repo. And if you look in it, it's got all the things like um, the, um, the memory is value is two, which is two gig of RAM that I selected earlier. Um, and um, and for four CPUs. And various other kind of um, bits of, of stuff. There's um, an etc. Docker directory, which has um, the daemon.json config file for Docker, which you can um, go and modify. Um, most of these things are, will be able to be configured through the, um, through the advanced settings interface in the future when we've finished adding those in. But um, in, in, if you, if you um, we don't document the Git storage directly, but in fact, if you go there, modify them, Git commit, it should restart your, um, restart your Docker and uh, apply the new settings. Um, there's also a, um, inside the VM, which I, I'm in the VM here, um, there's also a database directory, and you can see that the, um, you get a file system view of the Git repository. Um, so that's the master branch. Um, I can look at in there, and I can see the same things from the file system point of view. So we've got a, there's a, so one of the things that data Git provides you with is a file system view of your Git repo. Um, which you can create transactions and things like that, which is really, um, uh, and you can watch, you can watch for changes in a, in a Git repo. Um, so there's, there's actually loads and loads of things you can do with, um, with data kit. Um, it's a, um, there's loads more stuff that we're going to be using it for in future. We've got a whole lot of use cases around continuous integration and stuff like, and building things, um, and other stuff. Um, so do check it out. It's um, again, it's part of the um, stuff that came from Unikernels. It was part of the Mirage project. It's written in OCaml, um, so it's a good excuse to learn OCaml. Um, plumbing. There's a lot of plumbing when you build something like this. Um, we actually found ourselves because we, we've got all these separate components. There's the Mac and there's the virtual machine, or there's Windows and the virtual machine. We actually had to plumb a lot of stuff up. There's Docker running with a Docker client on the Mac and the Docker server, and a Docker daemon running on the on the Linux VM. So we tried various things, but eventually we um, started using VSOC and Hyper VSOC, which are actually quite little known but rather useful um, things. They're basically Unix sockets, but for talking to a, between um, virtual machines. So um, VSOC um, we use on the Mac and Hyper VSOC on Windows. Um, you can just create what looks pretty much like a Unix socket, but with a different addressing scheme, which addresses where you can, you can communicate between the host and the um, and the VM with different socket numbers. Um, so. The big advantage for what we had is that basically it can talk, you can talk to the virtual machine without having to communicate over a network port, um, which means that when you talk to Docker, it doesn't, the networking on the virtual machine doesn't actually have to be running for you to talk to Docker, which is incredibly useful for things like diagnostics and making sure that if, when we're developing it, when something goes wrong, um, and the networking doesn't come up, we can still talk to the virtual machine in order to debug it. So we have a whole lot of diagnostic stuff that runs over 
over these sockets. Um, the, there's a whole, um, um, there's a Docker diagnose command that um, you can run, which basically, uh, oh, oh, is there a Docker? Oh, we took it out. We took it out of the docker night. Ah, oh, but it, you can get it here. It, it runs it here. It's the same thing. Um, there. So, um, uh, there's a, I noticed this when I was testing this the other day. There's a nice message saying failure, no error was detected, which is um, <laughs> we should fix, really. Because <laughs> um, uh, actually having no error is not usually a failure. Um, uh, I meant to file an issue for that when I checked. Um, so this basically will connect, communicates to all the parts of the system and checks over the over the sockets, checks everything's um, everything's working happily. Um, these are, a lot of this code is actually quite new, and we've got we've got kernel patches um, for this, if you want, which you can take a look at. Um, there, it's being up. The Hyper-V sockets in particular are just being upstreamed in the next now, and we found a few bugs because we seem to be early users of them. VSOC itself is actually quite old. VMware developed it, but it was mainly used purely in the VMware products and not used anywhere else. Um, um, next thing I'm going to talk about is Moby. So Moby is the code name for the version of Linux that runs. For some, Moby is, is the name of the, of the whale mascot. And for some reason, Docker had never actually had a project called Moby before, which was a bit weird, so we stole the name. Um, but Moby is really basically Alpine Linux. Um, so Alpine Linux has been around for, um, I think, around eight years now. It's, um, it's quite old. Um, it's got a growing community. A lot of people use it running inside their containers, and that's how they come across it. But it's um, always actually been something you can install on your Linux machine. Um, it's really small. Um, it's designed for security. Um, it's really lightweight. It was designed to boot in a really stateless way from basically from a RAM disk um, rather than actually being hard installed, which is great because that's exactly what we wanted for, for this. Basically, whenever you, whenever you start up Whenever, this, whenever you start up Docker here, it, it just boots up the Linux process, which takes a few seconds. Um, and it, if, um, if anything gets changed on the system, like you run a privileged container which ch messes up the Linux system, you just have to restart. You just restart with the restart button here, and everything will go back to exactly how it was from the, um, the state of the file system. Um, everything except your actual Docker containers, obviously, which are stored on the, on the QMU, for the um, QCAL format disk, that, um, which is so it's basically the, the bar is mounted. Um, all the customized configuration is stored in the in the database, um, so everything it reads up about um, the um, things like. Um, the network bits of network configuration and um, the Docker, etc. Docker daemon and things like that. So any all the config for everything that runs is stored in the database so that it's persistent. Um, so it's 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 very much like the kind of Phoenix server model except for for a desktop. So you just create a, every time you if you want to update it, we don't update the packages on it. We just ship you a new version of Docker for Mac with a new version of Maybe in it. Um, it's just designed to run Docker. That's all it does. It comes, boots Docker, starts Docker, and that's and a few other things. And there's some. Um, it's but its basic function is just to make the Docker daemon run. Um, you can, if you want to customize it yourself, um, the easiest way to do it is basically like everything: use containers. Um, a privileged container can write into the file system. Um, you can build new kernel modules and install them. There's an example with the, um, the Sysdig people have a 
um, set up to install Sysdig on your um, on Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows if you want to use Sysdig. Try it out. Um, so that builds a kernel module, installs it, and um, you, you can just set the thing. If you set use restart always, then the container that installs the kernel module restarts every time Docker restarts, and so it'll always insert a kernel module. Um, if you want a root shell, you can get one with Docker with privileged. This is a slightly um, obscure uh, and long command line, which you might want to use an alias for. Um, but basically, it uses namespaces to enter into the namespaces of um, the init process, which basically is always in, in the host namespace. And so um, that's what I'm using here. And so this gives you that. And you can see everything about the system, the, um, the network interfaces, um, the root file system, and everything like that's all there. So you can, you can look in the logs, although the logs are actually um, also available on the Mac. Um, and you can, um, you can, if you, if you um, want, you can actually, you can, it's just a normal Alpine system, and you can run APK update. And if you want to install something, like you want to debug something, and you can, oops, you can you forget that it's not Debian. Um, <laughs> um, uh, and so it, you can install new packages, but if I reboot this, it'll, that'll all be gone and be back to the standard default setup. So um, you shouldn't generally have any reason to modify the, the system, but it's all there for you if you want to. Um, I mean, we, we don't kind of encourage it, but then if you're, you know, you're here in the black belt session, so obviously you're allowed to do whatever you like. Um, um, and it is useful to be able to do things like install kernel modules if, the, if there's something that we haven't built in. Um, it's a currently just a 4.4.13 stable kernel with the VSOC and Hyper VSOC patches and AUFS support. Um, there currently aren't any kernel modules, but it's support, it's not, it is a modular kernel in that you can add your own. Um, it's got support for overlay and AUFS. We're using a AUFS as the default, um, but we're going to try the new. Well, Docker 112 came with a new Overlay 2 driver, which is a new version of Overlay, which gets rid of a lot of the issues with the original version. So we're going to try that out as maybe as maybe switch to the as a default soon. Um, loads of people have asked us. Originally, the kernel was quite, had, didn't have support for things, but people have asked us for NFS support. Um, uh, Creu, if anyone was at the talk, um, that's been added very recently um, because someone said, hey, I want to try this out. So um, if you want to try anything like that, it has support for um, bin format MISC, which is a way of um, emulating different architectures so you can um, actually run um, um, ARM, ARM or PowerPC binaries on it. So this is, um, this is a container that's um, basically just um, if this container has basically an ARM system that you could run on a Raspberry Pi. As you can see, the files in it are um, ARM objects, but I can just run that container and um, and it just behaves like a normal, um, just like a normal container, but it's fully emulated using QMU. So you can test out stuff that you're building for your your um, Raspberry Pi or your IoT project. Just run it in the in the container. Um, there's a bit of documentation on how on what you need to do to do that. Um, we we'll, hopefully we'll make it even easier soon. But um, that's quite cool. People have. Um, Lots of people have discovered this and are using it. Um, supports other architectures as well, PowerPC, um, MIPS, various other things that you might want to use. Um, the kernel patches are all uh, for convenience inside the actual image. So if you um, um, look at etc. kernel patches, they're all those are all the um, they're mostly the Hyper VSOC pa patches and the VSOC patches. Um, so um, 
don't spam the logs with unknown ge GUIDs patch. Um, <laughs> Um, so, um, if you want to take a look at what we're, do what we're doing, um, then, or if you want to build the kernel, a new kernel yourself or anything, you can just do that from those patches. And the, um, and the kernel config is available as well in PROC. Um, so, you, which is useful if you want to build a kernel module. Um, as I said, it's Alpine Linux, recently updated to 3.4. We use the static builds of Docker link with seccomp support. Um, you can see if you do, um, um, if you just do um, Docker info, um, Docker now tells you that it's got, which security options it's got set. So we don't currently have AppArmor support in it, just seccomp. Um, we may add AppArmor later. Um, um, then there's a bunch of uh, random code that we've got in there, um, file synch time synchronization, things like that. This will all be open sourced as well. Um, once we, it's stabilized a bit, we're still, um, so after, after Docker's not a beta, Docker from Mexican Windows are not betas anymore, we'll open source that as well, and you can play with it, build it yourself. It's all quite straightforward. It's all built inside containers. You can just build it using um, Docker for Mac or Windows, just uh, um, um, like, it, any, like anything else. You don't need to install development tools. You just, type, just do make. Next component, VPN kit. Now, um, if you want to know more about VPN kit, I'm only going to say a little bit. Come to Mindy's talk tomorrow at 2.25 in here, and she'll tell you far more, um, much better than I will. Um, so again, VPN Kit's another open source project now. Um, we, the aim is to open source all the components. Um, it's being used on the Mac, and it's available as an option on Windows, but we're hoping to switch to it by default on Windows. So what it does is it basically takes all the network traffic that comes out of your um, Linux VM, and it kind of reconstructs it um, as application traffic on OS X, so that um, it, as far as OS X is concerned, it's just a program that sits there and it um, is just opening sockets and doing network connections. Um, so it, we don't need, on the on the Mac. We no longer have to have a, um, a, a network interface. Um, we just have. The normal ones that you're, you know, your normal ones. There's no special network interface that um, corresponds to the Linux VM. Everything just happens as if it's a normal application. And part of the reason for that was that um, doing it with a separate network interface really, really messes with when, with people who've got corporate VPNs in particular or firewalls and things like that. And basically, containers just don't work very well often for people who've got those types of setup, um, because their containers won't be able to reach the internet, which is really annoying. So this was our way of fixing that. Um, and it um, really makes things um, kind of quite straightforward. Um, um, as Mindy will tell you more tomorrow, VPN Kit uses the network stack out of the Mirage Unikernel um, to basically understand the TCP traffic. Um, Mirage is basically a set of system libraries which you can just take out, and the great thing about them is you can just use uh, these libraries in completely unrelated programs that have nothing to do with unikernels really easily. Um, and that's actually incredibly cool because just having access to a reliable network stack is incredibly important. Um, there are similar projects. Um, uh, there's one called Slurp, which has been used for a very, very, very long time to do things like this. It's incredibly buggy. Um, this way, we've got complete control over it, and um, Mindy can fix all the bugs, because um, she's very good at doing that, um, if, the, if there are any. Um, so we've got the network. The other thing that's really important is the file system. Um, David, who's sitting in the front row there, waves. Um, is the main developer on this, so um, if you've got really questions on it, do ask him. Again, it's currently only being used on the Mac. 
Um, on the Windows, we're doing a Samba mount instead. Uh, hopefully, we'll port OS X surface to Windows soon, but we'll have to think of a new name for it. <laughs> um, so that'll probably take a long time. Um, so basically, the way it works is it uses Fuse, um, which basically, um, Fuse basically t is a is file system in user space. It basically tells you everything that's going on in the file system, um, tells your, a program that you're running everything that's going on in the file system and lets you basically um, tell the computer what the output of that result would be. So what it does in this case is it transports any file system operation that's on a shared volume with the Mac, transports it over the VSOC onto the Mac, converts it into an OSX file system call, and then as well, it listens for file system notifications in OSX and replays them back over on Linux. Um, so the file system notifications, I'll show you a kind of little um, demo. We can basically, um, we can just run this container here. I'm going to share a directory with my, using minus V, the, my, the current directory I'm in, with the slash inotify directory. And I'm going to call this little container, which basically just has a, and it runs the iNotify wait program, which basically just tells you what's going on um, with notifications. So that's on. So that's running in a container, and I'll go onto my Mac here, and I um, I can create a file. Let's call it banana. And here we've told it's a file called banana has been created, and it's been modified by writing test to it. Then I can remove the file. And it tells me it's been deleted. Magic. So basically, every every change that we um, 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 every change we make here will be um, reflected over there in the container, so your container can see it. So any kind of notification you have there, it's all um, it's all working. Um, there are a few um, there are a few little issues that are inevitable. Um, if I read this file, I don't get a notification. Linux actually does have file system notifications for reads, uh, but the Mac doesn't. It's a kind of weird feature that I don't think anyone actually uses, um, really, when you notifying when you when you read a file because files are just read all over the place for all sorts of reasons. Um, the, the create, modify, and, and the events are um, and delete events are really the ones that people use. So those are the, those are the kind of um, key important things, and that's what will let you, when, you're, when you've modified your code, it can hot reload, um, and loads of other use cases as well. Um, basically, anything should just work. Um, so, um, um, it's kind of quite similar to VPN kit in a way. It's basically taking system operations you're doing on one machine and emulating them on another machine. File systems are a lot more different than network stacks. Sockets are pretty much the same on a Mac and Linux, more or less, whereas file systems are very different. I mean, OS X is not case sensitive and things like and it has different things. Um, we also we emulate a whole lot of stuff. My, people sometimes don't even really notice the fact that um, user IDs just kind of work on file systems with Docker for Mac. So um, as I showed you earlier, all, pretty much all the processes on here are running as your user, not as root, because we don't like to run stuff as root. Um, but OSXFS will pretend that files are not owned by, it won't tell you that they're all owned by the user on your Mac, because in a container, that's completely useless. So it'll tell you that they're owned by, um, um, there's going to be actually some choices of policy, but it'll, it'll tell you that they're owned by the user that's running in the container instead. Um, so it's completely, it's completely fake to work. You can also set user IDs. Um, David's laughing because he faked it, and he was quite um, embarrassed about faking it originally. But, um, but it basically means it just, just kind of works as if it just it does actually just work as if by magic and gets rid of a lot of problems about file sharing. And we can we're going to extend that kind of semantics so that you can have more control over how that works as well because it's um, 
actually incredibly useful. Windows file sharing, yeah, is, as I said, is kind of, at the moment is very different. Um, we use a Samba mount. Um, Samba does, in theory, support file system notifications, but no one bothered to tell the people who wrote the Linux implementation. So at the moment, there's no, no file system notifications on Windows, which is really annoying. Um, we will fix this. Um, we're, the plan is to port OS XFS to Windows, um, but it'll take a little while, because Windows file systems are even more different than Mac ones. Um, user interface, um, just going to talk about that a little bit. It's quite minimal at the moment, but we've got, it's got a lot of plans. It's all native code, um, and it's a really a, mainly um, either talks to the database or it looks through um, the diagnosis programs and things like that, as I showed you earlier. Um, it's, um, um, it's actually one of the kind of... Uh, GUI programs with the least GUI at the moment, but we are we are planning, particularly the preferences. Um, we just started adding these things now. There's a huge amount more. Um, the, if Docker config, for example, at the moment there's only a few options, but there's loads more stuff that um, actually you can generally do through the database now, so we can start adding the um, user interfaces to support it. Um, um, if you want to use it directly through the database, do um, ask afterwards. Um, we're going to probably, the plan was to integrate Kitematic at some point um, or a similar native graphical interface. Um, another thing is that you can't not notice when you use it is the design. There are a lot of really lovely whales hidden away inside. <laughs> um, happy whales, sad whales, uh, the diagnosis whale, the documentation whale, the networking whale. Um, these are just a few of them. Um, these were all drawn by, um, by Laurel, who um, uh, is um, around here somewhere. So if you see her, she's probably taking pictures. Um, do thank her for her lovely, um, her lovely whale pictures. She, it's the first time I've worked at a company that has an illustrator, and it really makes an amazing difference to... I mean, it, the application could be really boring if it didn't have a little bit of a little bit of niceness. You know, so even even when something goes wrong, the unhappy whale is quite funny and cheers you up. <laughs> um, and you, you have to let it crash just to see them. <laughs> um, so yeah, thanks, to Laurel. Um, I'm going to. I'm sure you've all got questions. You can ask them later, but I'm going to go preempt a few of them. Um, why doesn't my favorite feature work? Um, number one, net equals host. Now, when some of the magic things, so you can see that I'm running this presentation. It runs on localhost 8080, because this presentation, of course, runs in a container. Um, so how does it run on localhost? is a bit kind of magic, because obviously it's not really running on your Mac. So what happened, the way it works is that um, we actually use um, the, the, there's a Docker proxy process that runs um, every time you publish a port on Docker. Um, and we kind of hijack that interface. And there's actually, if you go and have a look inside the file system again, there's actually a um, a magic 9p file system called slash port that tells you, that basically gives you, is a communication thing between um, Linux and the host telling it which ports are current and need to be exposed because the users published those ports. So these, um, this is my um, presentation running here. Um, and this is a Swarm service when I was testing Swarm when the Swarm support was released. Um, so both those are running, and they're in this port file system. And there's, a, and the process basically goes, sits there, and adds new new things to there. So that's kind of how that works. But if you do net equals host and you run a service there, it doesn't. There's no publish event. Nothing happens. It just starts listening on the port, and we have no idea. So unfortunately, we can't publish that port to the Mac at the moment. So we have to find some way of doing that. So people keep saying, 
I've run it with net equals host, but I can't find my container. So that's the reason we will try and fix it, um, but it's not fixed yet. I can't connect to my containers directly. Um, yeah, at the moment, there's no routing to the Linux VM, and so there's no routing to bridge networks on the Linux VM. Um, if you want to connect, the best thing to do is just do it from a container, because containers can connect. You need to do this if you're using overlay networks rather than bridge networks, so it's kind of a good habit to get into. Um, we, we actually, I actually had this working at one point with routing, but it's not working. It won't work at the moment because there's no network interface that's visible. Um, yeah, it's kind of inconvenient, but um, it's, yeah, we'll, I don't know if we're going to fix that or when. Still things to do. Unix sockets between the host and the container don't actually work because they're actually different computers, much as we try and pretend it's the same one. Um, so um, we're actually going to fake this and make it work. David's promised. Um, <laughs> we're just going to use the VSOC layer or the hyper VSOC layer we've got and basically put your socket that you've magically created over there and it'll magically work, but it doesn't magically work yet. Um, in the meantime, use, use a network socket or something or just run everything in containers or something like that. It's, um, but we'll definitely do that because we're just, there's a bunch of use cases that do that. I mean, we already do it for the Docker socket, which um, magically is a Unix socket on the Mac and a Unix socket on Linux, and things automatically go over the two, but it's not configurable in that nice, easy way yet. Um, but yeah, we've got the infrastructure to do that now. Um, sound. Um, people want to, contain, to run audio in a container and it magically appear on their Mac, and no one's done that yet. I believe it's, it is possible. Um, and um, please give it a go. Let me Talk to me if you want to give it a go. For graphical stuff, you can actually use, well, obviously you can use HTTP, but um, VNC, RDP, X Windows, all are options if you want to do graphical applications. Um, I know some people have done that, and it definitely works. Um, so, in theory, you should be able to run kind of completely, in, you know, all sorts of applications, and we really want to help you do that. Um, and, um, yeah, it's just, there's been a few prototypes, but we really need to document it as well and get things like that working, but it's definitely possible. Um, got to work out how, what the easiest way of doing it and make sure it's all documented, but please come and talk if you're interested in things like that, because um, we know there's, there are lots of people who are interested in providing applications that are interactive, you know, non-command non line applications using Docker for Mac and um, shipping them. Um, what else are we going to do? At the moment, it's stability first, feature second, so if you've got desperate feature requests, they won't happen in, in the near term until, um, unless they're really, really, really straightforward things, in which case you might manage to, if you bribe one of the team, um, you can spot them because there are many of them are wearing our Doc of Mac t-shirts, which just arrived, um, or they're around here, or just ask on the booth. But um, yeah, at the moment we're just trying to do bug fixing. We realize that it's massively important because so many of you are using it all the time and it's got to work and we did mess a few things up. Sorry if we ate all your disk space. Um, <laughs> um, but features are driven by your requests. We do take notice of them even if we don't implement them straight away and please post on the forum, email us, talk to us, Twitter us, um, come and see us at the booth um, and tell us how you want to use it, what you can't do, what the problems are and we will we will fix those things. There's a huge number of often little tiny things that people have just asked for. And we just said, yeah, that's a great idea. We know, well, why didn't I think of that before? Yeah, of course we'll do that. Um, and you know, thanks very much for, for, for doing all that, you know, asking us. And in fact, thanks not only to you, also the team who built, helped build this, the huge number of people at Docker who've helped out in many ways. Um, and a huge number of open source projects, that's just a few of them. If you look in the acknowledgements um, in the about box, if you click on that, 
you'll get a full list of all the um, open source projects we've used. Um, it's very, 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 very long. Um, um, and um, those people, those have been incredibly helpful, um, particularly Exive, um, Mirage, which we've taken a lot of stuff from Alpine Linux, um, has been incredibly useful for making this thing easy to, easy to do. Um, if you've got questions, ask now, ask afterwards, come on, pigeon, I'll be around for the next, three, next few days. Um, if you want to look at this presentation and get the thing, you can just docker run it, of course. Um, and um, yeah, feel free, many of the team who worked on it are here, so if you've got questions about the internals of one bit or another, you, we can point you at the right person. Or, um, yeah. So okay, questions. we can take a couple of questions if you're leaving. Yeah, first, applause, Justin. <laughs> If you leave, please do it silently so we can take a couple of questions. Thanks. Uh, first off, uh, this is awesome. So great job. I think we're all really excited about this. Um, so I have a question about compatibility. Uh, we all know that Apple has no qualms breaking things or making major changes if they feel strongly about a user experience aspect. So I'm curious what you think about something in the future of the new version of OS X, or they came out with a new file system. Is that going to be a challenge for Docker for this? Um, I, actually, the file system looks quite cool. We haven't really tested it yet, but um, it's got sparse files, which is really useful and helps compatibility. It's finally, it's case sensitive, which um, if anyone has ever tried to get check out of the Linux source tree, will be very, very grateful for that, because it does not check out on a Mac. Um, so, I mean, the file system is pretty cool. Um, obviously, we're going to have to test with it, and that's great. Um, we actually, um, the hypervisor framework, you know, isn't going to go away. Um, Apple are encouraging people to use it. There's n not a massive amount of other things that we'd be worried about because we're pretty self-contained, um, apart from, you know, those two things. So. Um, yeah, we're not, we're not there's nothing we're particularly worried about. It'd be nice if they fix some of the bugs that we've reported that we found doing this, because we found quite a lot. Sure. Um, but yeah, there's, there's nothing we'd be particularly worried about. And we're, yeah, we'll hope to support the new version. I mean, uh, uh, various people has, have reported it works on the new version, but it's completely untested. Cool. But we'll Thank test you. it yeah. more thoroughly. Thank you. Um, does, how is Docker for Max uh, private registry support uh, holding up? Um, it's, it's basically, it's there internally, but we need to add some more user interface. At the moment, there's, um, you've got the um, insecure registries and registry mirrors settings here, um, but there's no interface for the SSL, if you want to upload an SSL certificate. It is actually there in the database support, and it will work as soon as there's an interface, or if you uh, put the magic things into the database by hand and get commit. Um, it, so, but it is a massive priority. It's um, it took us a bit too long to do those to do those bits, and it's we know it's annoyed quite a lot of people um, because it's been one of the most popular complaints. <laughs> I have a follow-up question, if I may. Uh, so, if once the private registries are working more simply, uh, how do you plan to add people who work behind proxies? and support them? So proxies, are, um, there's some preliminary support for proxies. At the moment, we um, do basically um, pass through HTTP proxy settings through, and those should, um, should now work. Um, it's quite early, and we plan to do some more work around supporting proxies better um, so that um, in, we need to teach VPN kit about how to do proxies directly, um, and then that will be much more transparent. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, um, it's, it's half there. If it doesn't work for you, let, let, please complain in the forums and say what's, what is working, what isn't working, because it's a quite, the bits we put in are quite new, so we're not, we haven't had much feedback on them yet, but it'd be really helpful to have some, but yeah, we are, it's, one of the important areas that we know is has been missing. 
Thanks. Another round of applause for Justine. And